Welcome everybody, I am Ocean Robbins and thrilled to be with you here today. We're going to be focusing today on how a healthy lifestyle can not just prevent disease, but also help to help you to optimize your health so you can feel good and perform at your best. Whether you want to walk without pain or you want to compete in a triathlon, what you eat and how you live can help you reduce inflammation, increase recovery time, and improve results so you can feel better and thrive. So today we are joined by performance medicine specialist, Dr. Reagan Stigman, to discuss ways to optimize nutrition and lifestyle for achieving peak performance and maximal wellness. We're here to help you do what you were born to do so you can love your life and get the most out of every precious moment. This is a project of Whole Life Club, which is Food Revolution Network's ongoing membership community. And some of the questions I will bring to this interview come from our Whole Life Club members. So now who are we joined by today? Dr. Reagan Stigman is a double board certified former active duty flight surgeon in the United States Air Force, as well as an associate professor of preventive medicine and lifestyle medicine and co-director of digital health at Rocky Vista University College of Osteopathic Medicine. As a former Olympic development level athlete in women's soccer for nearly two decades, she's been promoting health optimization with exercise, healthy food choices, and mindfulness. Dr. Stigman has served in leadership roles in the American College of Preventive Medicine and the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, and she was military liaison officer for the Game Changers documentary. She is passionate about human performance, positive psychology, and health promotion. Reagan, so great to be with you today. Ocean, it's an absolute pleasure to, to join you and uh, everybody tuning in today. I'm stoked to be here. Stoked. That's a good word. <laughs> uh, it's a good word for you because I think there's something about your, your presence that calls us to be more, to do more, to live more. Why should everybody, not just athletes, be interested in peak performance? Ocean, a great question that you toss out there. Um, and that idea of why should everyone, regardless of if you're an athlete or not, be interested in tapping into that core of performance, it's relevant because every single individual has something that they're good at. And what I've realized over my time, um, specifically my time uh, as an Air Force flight surgeon, was that when I was able to help my patients stoke that internal fire within themselves, they were actually able to maximize the volume and the profundity with which they were able to express what they're good at and execute what they're good at. So it was sort of uh, that beautiful cascade of um, helping people realize to their maximum capacity their true talent. Fabulous. Um, what do you think is the difference between optimizing performance and optimizing health? Is, is that a distinction we should be aware of and is overtraining more of a concern with age? Ocean, great question. And I think the difference between optimizing health versus optimizing performance, um, it's sort of nuanced. Um, I try to help people conceptualize sort of the tiered approach where when you optimize your health first, think of that sort of as a, you know, um, varsity level, high school sort of approaching where your end goal is for the Olympics, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so when you optimize your health, you're basically building up your biology to perform at its optimum capacity, physiologic capacity, essentially. How can you uh, do the best, do the most with what you were created with in your biology, your cells, mm -hmm. whereas performance optimization, that's sort of that next level up where you're maximizing and you're basically executing your biologic, physiologic um, potential. You're fulfilling mm -hmm. that. And I think, you know, that's sort of this idea of like the Olympics. When you, when you show up at the Olympics, you are primed and ready to rock mm -hmm. and to do your best at the right. highest level. So that's kind of the distinction that I want to land at. And um, you had a follow on question about this concept of is overtraining more of a concern when you age. And I think, you know, uh, with a grain of salt, um, it's really important to stay mobile, to achieve physical activity throughout your life. And being physically active is way superior than being sedentary at any 
at any phase, uh, but there's strategy in how you approach it and approach it the right way. And being particularly sensitive, uh, quite honestly, Ocean, at any age group, uh, whether you have pre-existing medical conditions, checking in with your healthcare provider or your doctor before you launch onto maybe a performance regimen um, is always a smart place to start. Are there um, some people you know, run marathons or ultra marathons. Oh, I had a friend once who actually his life dream was to run a hundred mile, hundred miles without stopping. And he did it. Um, although I'm sad to say that his knees were never the same again. Um, like he had a hard time running ever again after that because he damaged himself. Mm -hmm. Do you see that sometimes where people are so intent on a goal that they don't listen to their body signals and actually create harm and, and, and are there any principles you've learned for how to tell the difference so that, because obviously we want to lean into our capacity because that's how it grows, but at the same time, we don't want to cause lasting damage. Ocean, great, great question there about, you know, pay, paying attention to your body and what it's telling you. Um, and at the same time, trying to reach those uh, maximum uh, breaking through that status quo plateau goal of just being at a standard baseline where most people are living. And I think particularly as we age, that is something that you have to pay extra attention to uh, because it, it is very easy to just say, no, push through this. This is what we're taught uh, mm -hmm. young in this country, certainly like no pain, no gain. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, you know, there's plus and minuses to that adage as well. And I think um, you have to be cognizant of perhaps some of the accrued or the um, consolidated uh, injuries that might have stacked up over time that you might not necessarily be familiar with. So if you're trying to run your first Ironman at age 60, but you haven't ever prepared or not to dissuade anybody from doing that, I think that's a great uh, thing to think about, but yeah. you, you want to keep in mind what kind of a frame you're using to launch into a pretty demanding physiologic endeavor. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that uh, one of the goals of health is actually to be able to lean into your capacity more fully. I think about when I haven't worked out at the gym for a long time, I actually, my first time back, I've got to go really slow and not, not push myself. It's not safe to go to my max because uh, I'll be so in pain the next day if I do, because my body needs to kind of warm up. But when I'm, when I'm in a groove, I can, I can use more of my capacity. I can lean into it more. Similarly with running, if I haven't run for a long time, I need to start with like a five minute jog and then the next day maybe a 10 minute jog. If I start, I, I've run, you know, a marathon before, but I can't, if, I've t if I haven't run for a couple of years, which has happened a few times in my life, then I've got to start really, really slow and just incrementally move up. And so it seems to me that part of the goal of health is to have a baseline out of which we can push ourselves so that it's safe to get into uh, 150 beat per minute heart rate. So it's safe to get into that, that, that joy that comes, that kind of ecstasy that comes from giving our all, but it's not necessarily safe to do that when the foundations are not there. Would you agree with that? Well, Ocean, you hit the nail on the head when it comes to, I think it's sort of um, an inherent American element of so many of us in this country where we want to immediately be at that, you know, I can run a marathon tomorrow t uh, frame of mind when we're starting a program. And we, and many of us actually um, pigeonhole ourselves and frequently um, cut ourselves short of what value looks like in um, strategic stack up, stack up, stack up of um, small goals into larger uh, end goals like running a marathon. And I think the important thing that we need to keep in mind is that those small accomplishments are what are the foundational building blocks to the ultimate, you know, big pyramid of what you want, something big, an Ironman, a century ride, something like that. So, um, and yeah, this is where we really need to pull ourselves back, do that baseline check-in and say, what are, what are we working with here? What's realistic? Um, I think this is also a great opportunity to weave in experts. There are professionals out there, physical therapists, professional or personal trainers who can help triage um, that tiered approach because mm -hmm. um, there's nothing more motivating too than setting small goals, reaching those goals, and then gradually working your way up that staircase to success. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about inflammation. Why is it a critical piece of the recovery equation and how do diet and lifestyle impact inflammation levels? Great question. So 
inflammation ocean, I really want people to keep sort of in two buckets. We have acute inflammation, which typically happens after a, a strenuous event, jogging, doing a bicycle ride, uh, which is inherent to how our human body responds to um, movement, uh, growing muscles, lifting weights. You're actually tearing part of your muscle, um, which, which is how you get stronger. That's how you get those big biceps, right? And I think the, the thing that we're thinking about is how the inflammation with acute um, trauma, we'll call it for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. um, and acute exercise, that's synonymous with acute inflammation, acute trauma happening to your, your bicep or something. Um, that inflammation essentially stimulates cells to trigger muscle repair and regeneration. That's, that's a inherent, wonderful facet of our human biology. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's, DNA connection points that, uh, you know, have, for lack of a better term, like discussions between one another and say, hey, this is healthy, healthy inflammation that's going to help us grow. Uh, whereas um, chronic inflammation or, you know, long term um, hotbed is what I call it, long term hotbedding of your cell line, like the milieu in which you are keeping your cells that kind of chronic inflammation is what contributes to chronic disease. Some things like obesity, overweight, uh, gout, heart disease. I mean, uh, almost every single foundation of chronic disease is inflammation. So it really serves us to not only optimize acute inflammation by mitigating what we're, what we're adding to our system from a lifestyle perspective. And when we do things like add healthy foods that are high in phytonutrient value. So for example, um, super colorful foods that grow from nature. Whenever you see those amazing striking pigments, those are phytonutrients. Those are antioxidants. Those are the things that target essentially what are free radicals or inflammation in your body and say, Hey, you know, we're not going to let you continue damaging cell lines, um, contributing to, uh, what were previously healthy cells converting into unhealthy cells and creating disease. Um, so absolutely does the choice that every individual make with respect to their food, particularly right after um, a, a pretty demanding event like that, that has impact six ways from Sunday. Um, so thinking about that in the short term and the long term, not mm -hmm. only for um, your repair and your recovery, but also for your long term health. I think that's a really important thing to do um, just as a smart habit. Yes, thank you. It, the the pillars of lifestyle medicine, which is really the focus of your work now, are could be summarized as eat better, stress less, love more, and move more. And I think all of these are important. Uh, it seems to me that all of them are critical to bringing down chronic inflammation. Um, and um, you know, I'm hearing you saying that you know short term inflammation, like a response to stress, is part of how the body recovers and actually it metabolizes the new the new strength that it's building, but chronic inflammation actually gets in the way of the ability for the body to surge and then settle uh, and do its job well. Um, it seems like uh, eating better, obviously, you, you were just talking a bit about that when we get the phytonutrients that we need and we're not assaulting our body with compounds that cause chronic inflammation, then that's going to settle things. Um, so that's the eat better part. Stress less is going to be obviously things, anything that brings down, brings up chronic stress is going to be a detrimental to inflammation because when we're in a fight or flight reactive space, well, that's inflammatory, right? Um, and then obviously we talk about uh, loving more, just having healthy relationships and the value that that gives to, a, to an organism, to a person. And then, and then moving more, which is a big part of your work as well. Um, Let's let's talk a bit about the moving more piece for people who have maybe different levels of activity and are interested in enhancing that. So I'm going to give you three different examples, and I'd love to hear your 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 picture of how that that person might move more in a healthy way. So example one is someone who's been sedentary for a while. Um, what would you suggest for a fitness routine to help them ease into more movement? Ocean. So really. Once again, um, stratifying where we are and not looking outside of ourselves to try to compare because we frequently lose sight of uh, the exact moment where we are. And that's where every one of us should begin. So, you know, don't try to fault yourself if you've been sedentary for so long. Don't try to talk yourself out of these things like this is just a reality and this is a reality for many people. So have some grace for yourself, too, and just acknowledging that you're one interested in 
changing your pattern. That is a huge, uh, you know, uh, fire igniter um, Mm -hmm. that you should really hone in on. And I think, you know, one of the recommendations that I make for people who are coming off of a sedentary status is, you know, find something that just gets you moving a bit. And whether that's doing a flight of stairs instead of taking an elevator or something simple like taking a walk around your block. You don't want to land in this hyper system shock space. Um, You need a sustainable segue to changing habits, right? And um, once again, we, we can't go, we can't expect, you know, the adage that I use ocean is this idea of you start a language class in school and pretend you're in kindergarten of that language. You can't go to 12th grade language overnight, right? You have Mm -hmm. to, you have to understand the, me- the mechanics and how you get to first grade, second grade, third grade, all the way up. It's, it's a process just like anything else. Yeah, so true. Um, it's, um, I also just want to put in a word for using what you've got. You know, if you can't walk, use your arms. You know, if one arm's sprained, try to use the other arm. You know, do what you can with what you have to work with. And some of us have physical challenges or, you know, um, blocks that, that are real and challenging. Um, but it, if you use what you have and make the most of it, it tends to expand. And, and, and one thing and skills grow. Uh, one thing to add to that, you're, you're so spot on ocean. And I think, you know, get creative when it comes to using what you have and you don't necessarily have to go out and buy a brand new set of weights. Um, you can grab weights at a, a thrift shop. You can use mm-hmm. cans of food in your, in your cupboards. Like that's an easy set of reps. If you're interested in doing some lightweight, you know, overhead presses, uh, bicep curls, I mean, start getting creative. And another great thing to focus on ocean is your body is a fantastic source of weight resistance. Mm -hmm. So do small things, a a wall sit, maybe a squat or a lunge, Mm -hmm. something like that. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, a, a pistol squat on one leg. I can't even do that. So once again, it's just, it's learning what kind of small hacks you can do with what you have to let those small hacks stack up to big hacks. Thank you. Okay. So option number two, scenario number two is there's an avid walker who doesn't do strength training. They never have. They just go for walks, but their upper body, they want to, they want to do more with it. Any suggestions? First of all, why is strength training important? Number one. And number two, how would someone move into that? Fantastic question. And I think, you know, really the the recommendations for adults across the board is 150 minutes of moderate exercise uh, over the course of a week or 75 minutes of intense exercise over the course of a week. Um, Amongst that recommendations for two, two days or two, two sittings worth of essentially um, strength training resistance using the big muscle groups in your body, your legs, your core, your arm, your back, et cetera. Um, and it's really vital for um, strength training to be combined in um, general activities because you build bone strength through um, physical activity in that space of um, actively either using um, dumbbells or your own body weight resistance, which is how I'm going to answer your question, Ocean, is that once again, use what you have and your body is a brilliant set of weights. So Mm -hmm. if you're trying to get more strength, you can do things like, you know, um, up, up, Uh, against a wall push-ups, for example. You don't have to get down on the floor. Those are so hard. I still do those from my knees, if I can be honest, and that's fine. And and my weakest part is my upper body. So that's something that I'm working actively on. And um, basically, even as mentioned previously, doing things like lunges or sumo squats, you have a frame of your body that is stacked on top of your big muscle groups. So when you're doing a squat, single leg, double leg, that counts as strength resistance. And I I wanna make sure people really understand, you don't necessarily have to have a gym membership. Um, Do do, uh, those exercises that that make you comfortable. Some people aren't comfortable being in gyms. And I mean, I work out from home five days a week and it's convenient and I don't have an excuse not to. I have a bike downstairs, I have weights downstairs. Um, But I've had to redefine what working out looks like for me as I've aged as well. I think that a lot of people um, worry about how much time it takes and I just want to say like it doesn't have to take much time like five minutes a day can change your life and you may find that after you start doing that a little more 
is more fun and easier. But like starting where you are, and it's actually amazing how much you can tire muscles in five minutes. I mean, I can't do push-ups for five minutes, you know, but you know, whenever I've done it, like I do push-ups every day till I can't, till I have to stop. And then, you know, it doesn't take long and I'm completely winded and my, my pecs are exhausted. And then it's like, okay, then the next day I can do a little more. And it's so, and that, that's not a time issue. That's, that's, that's something else that blocks us there. So uh, a lot of times we think it's about time and, you know, really it's about other forms of resistance and our brain is using time as kind of an excuse, I will say. So just to like lean into that and say, okay, let's not, let's not call this about time. Let's call this about other forms of resistance and then make it friendly. And maybe it's about that we associate it with pain. So maybe you start in a way that isn't painful. It's just, just softening into it. And then over time, it becomes more a source of aliveness rather than suffering. And Ocean, you bring up a brilliant point that I really like to foot stomp with my patients and just to give them once again, if you don't have the perspective on this kind of stuff or what this could look like or starting where you are, um, it's it's almost a recipe for disaster. And I think mm -hmm. that the real essential here, and you, you tapped right onto it, is this idea of non-zero days. And so, for example, even if you just do one push-up today in any capacity, that's a non-zero day. Even if you do something uh, active for five minutes today, you, you walk outside, you walk up and down your block to the end, that is a non-zero day. So in theory, what you're trying to do with this idea of having non-zero days is to string together as many non-zero days as consecutively possible. Uh, because what happens is when, you know, the way that sort of we're programmed as humans, um, we find it very easy to fall into sort of that downward negative spiral. And we have to find useful ways to climb out of that and then accelerate past beyond um, to those big lofty goals and those health goals and those exercise goals that we have on our projected radar, the, the North Star sort of logic. Mm -hmm. And and that is truly how you break habit. And and I'll tell you, and it's kind of funny, and I have it right here too. Um, I had to start finding a useful way. So I have a calendar where I tracked essentially physical activity. I write it down. I'm looking at it multiple times a day, re reinforcing and saying, hey, even just a 10 minute dog walk counts on like an active rest day. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I love that idea. And patients really latch onto that and just say, break the cycle, break the cycle, put a, put a set of dumbbells or use those heavier cans of uh, food in the garage and go, go lift them. That's easy. That counts and start retraining your brain to believing that that kind of movement does count because if you're doing that ocean five minutes a day times 365 days, that is not an insignificant amount of time. And I wager after those 365 days, you're going to feel at a different baseline, perhaps. And it only took five minutes a day. So right. it's powerful, the perspective that you have. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, scenario three is a dedicated yoga practitioner who wants to enhance their cardio fitness. So what's the pathway they might take? And what are the benefits of cardio? Great question. So um, an avid yoga practitioner or somebody who might already be a little bit more physically active, um, I think, you know, there's beauty and novelty. And I think that's really where you want to sort of tap into um, people or athletes or people who are just physically active, period, end, to try something new, um, whether that looks like um, a bachata lesson or doing dance that might be a little bit more technically related, where you're still getting that kind of motion um, in a different way. You have to hold your body. You have to hold balance in a totally different way that most people are not familiar with. Um, but that can still absolutely require endurance in a way that many people aren't used to as well. Um, I would also recommend Ocean um, shifting maybe to the pool. Uh, once again, you're, you're in a net neutral weight uh, environment where you're you know, firing different muscle sets um, mm -hmm. that you don't always fire when you're uh, inverted in downward dog, for example. Mm -hmm. And I think it's keeping your brain and your body stimulated with um, just functioning and firing different muscle groups, um, especially if you're routinely active. Mm -hmm. And I would say the real big utility for um, cardio exercise is keeping your heart healthy and just ensuring that you have a baseline level of endurance, which 
we know, and science has proven time and again, um, the more cardiovascular capacity that you have, um, the more strength training you're doing for your heart, for your metabolic system, for your vascularity at large, um, keeping things patent, keeping things open so that you're able to feed your cells and your heart and your brain and every other organ system for that matter, mm -hmm. um, in a, in a functional, useful, healthy way. Yeah. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, I want to also just put in a word for play. Um, I think that, you know, when we were kids, most of us played around in the playground and as we get older, we stop playing as much and we tend to think of exercise as a chore, as a, as a thing to do. Um, but it can be fun. And in my experience, when we can have some forms of exercise that we really enjoy, that we look forward to, that light up our life, that make us feel more alive, um, then it's intoxicating. I mean, for me, that's racquetball. Um, at other times in my life, it's been basketball. At other times, it's been it's been running with my dad or working out with my dad. Like things that, that are just, there's another element that isn't just, I'm doing something good for my health. It's painful, but I'm going to do it anyway. You know, like that's usually not going to work very well long term. You've got to have a positive association with some form of pleasure or motivation that's deeper than just I'm checking it off my list so I don't die later. You know, I think from a from a brain standpoint, we've got to wire ourselves to to look forward to movement. Uh, and yeah, sure, routine and pattern are helpful. We do some things we don't look forward to. I don't look forward to brushing my teeth, but I do it anyway. And I do it regularly because it's a habit, right? So. But there are other things that they will do more of and do a better job of when there's some some enthusiasm behind it. Any thoughts on how to how to find your inner uh, passion for for movement? I, I love this question, Ocean, because um, not only can exercise or physical activity be fun, but moreover, it should be fun. And I think that is the task for each and everybody who is interested, who in in essentially capitalizing, capitalizing rather on maximum gains from their biologic physiology. Mm -hmm. And I would say, um, you know, if you're not, if you're not having fun, then start having fun. And whether that's, you know, you consult what's, what's more fun than, you know, having to trudge to the gym, uh, you know, and ocean to your point. I mean, I've recently found pickleball. I I'm a big believer yeah. in that. Like, I love that. <laughs> And and, I, and it's great. And it's just a, a new twist on a conventional sport. Tennis. I love tennis, love mm -hmm. racquetball. Um, but, you know, I really think that is so vitally important. And whether you're doing sport or physical activity with other people is essential, too. And I have found that sweet spot of just being able to, you know, get downstairs, get on my bike, turn the music all the way up, you know, push through some of my my most difficult personal records um, and just like sit with myself and do that and find joy in that. But also, you know, with my background of playing competitive soccer for so long, um, that was a shift that I had to get used to as well, because I found success through physical activity with others. And I think it, it begs the question of, hey, how can you engage more with your um, community? Uh, you know, there's message boards all over. Um, I mean, just asking the question, people are interested in, you know, taking walks around the neighborhood or things, things that are simple, but you sort of have to hunt for it. And so that's a task that I like to put out there for people as well, is um, to, to hunt for that kind of fun. And whether that's, you know, you, you ruck up to the, the incline or the 200 stair incline um, and you see so many other people and you just high five them along the way. I mean, that, that's a big intrinsic motivator for me. And, and a final point, Ocean, what, what I really help patients conceptualize um, mm -hmm. is this idea of not celebrating is not an option. Mm. And, that, and that means um, essentially I, I prescribe and I mandate that, hey, this is just like I was, if I was telling you to take a pill every day, mm -hmm. you need to get a calendar or put something somewhere where you can see it. And every single day, your task and your, your prescription assignment is to write down your success of the day or your celebration of the day. And, you know, to that end, here I go. I'm going to hand everybody their life trophy and their golden unicorn. <laughs> but it's not a life trophy. It's a every single day trophy because that is how you essentially preserve and you stoke that fire. When you're yeah. looking at that, you're looking at an entire month of February, for example, and being like, whoa, I had 28 huge successes today. That is that sustainer piece that really mm. helps reinforce. And I find that's and it's such a joy to do, too. You get to look back and say, Oh, this is this is fantastic, and it's all on one sheet of paper. 
Just a suggestion that if you're going to reward yourself for your good accomplishments, make sure the rewards are aligned with your health and wellness. So for example, you know, for some big milestone moment that you want to reward yourself for, maybe get a massage or, you know, do something that's enjoyable, that feels good to you, you know, um, spend some time with a loved one or, you know, uh, t t t have a longer meditation practice or something that feels like a treat, have a bath, you know, under the stars, whatever. But don't reward yourself with like cake or cookies or ice cream or something that actually takes you backwards because that actually can send the brain very complex signals about what self-care and vitality really are. I and I see that. that a lot. People are like, all right, I worked out today, so I earned it. So now I'm going out for a treat, you know, and then they get something that, that sets their health back. Yes. And, and creates more inflammation in their body. And it's, it's very sad when I see that. Um, and I get the intent, but we can, we can align our, um, our reward systems with health. And, and I think that's a great point that you bring up too. Like try not to use your physical activity as essentially uh, a punishment for food that you ate, because that's mm. a, that's a, a negative loop in your brain that will associate, well, if I have this cake, then I have to work out. Mm -hmm. And that's a big demotivator too. And, mm -hmm. you know, you should, you should be excited about moving because you can, and regardless of what your ability level, um, you can dial in however you, you are able to move and you can certainly find professionals or you can do research yourself and uh, optimize those pathways to, to what's mobile for you. And, and I think that's the beauty part of um, shifting that perspective for physical activity in particular. Yeah, thank you. Let's move to some member questions. Claire asked, what type of ratios of different types of exercise, aerobic, resistance, focus drills, etc., do you suggest for overall peak performance at age 60 plus? So I want to thank Claire for that great question. And I think, you know, first and foremost, um, especially for mature adults, uh, I really want to help uh, reinforce this idea, like try not to limit yourself by thinking I'm too old to start or I won't be able to learn it or I'm too old, I'll get hurt. You know, like you are, you are a brilliantly built human machine and you at any age are certainly built to not only heal, but also to perform. And so the recommendations for older adults uh, are similar to those of um, individuals age 65 and under as well. So once again, that 150 minutes of moderate exercise every single day or every uh, week rather, and then two days of strength training. But the big kicker here, which I find useful and honestly, I recommend to people at every stage of their life is balance exercises that really help hone in those core muscles, keeping you strong, uh, keeping you nimble and limber. Uh, and, and that I think far too many people in Ocean, I'll tell you, I've seen very, very many people. Um, typically, there is sort of a, the um, undercurrent of um, overweight or obesity that can really offset the balance and that can cause musculoskeletal injury, which ends up becoming a sustained long term injury that um, minimizes um, the, the prosperity of life in, in work or in enjoyment, being able to do physical activity. So um, really, I, I think hitting those marks that are, you know, allocated by the CDC. And, and if you're curious about what those, um, what does moderate exercise look like? There's, there's fantastic spreadsheets out there. Um, and you can just Google um, physical activity, CDC um, requirements and, and things like um, brisk walking, for example, is a moderate intensity aerobic activity, uh, vigorous activity, which you can do 75 minutes of is something like jogging or running, um, or a mixture of the two. And then of course the two days of, um, working major muscle groups, legs, hips, back, um, your core shoulders, arms, etc. Um, though you can get like a laundry list basically of what those uh, activities look like. And then some of the recommendations for balance activities, walking backwards in a safe environment, standing on one leg, um, using a wobble board a couple of times a week, things like that. Useful at any age. Yeah, thank you. Um, Ellie said, I'd like some attention on exercise performance for those who do not have a perfect able body. I take myself as an example. I have a bad knee meniscus problem and not a good candidate for surgery. I walk with a cane for short distances and a walker for longer distances. I will still want to be as able as I can be with my current body without risking further damage to it. 
I'm not expecting medical advice. I have good doctors, but some extra advice on exercising with a less able body would be very nice. Swimming, while a nice option in general, isn't always possible because you need a pool for that. Any uh, thoughts for Ellie here? Um, Ellie, thank you for that really astute question. And you're not alone in that um, more limited ability uh, status. And so I, I think first and foremost, don't don't let that prohibit you as Ocean and I were discussing earlier. And to that end, um, furthermore, set yourself up to succeed. And whether that's a referral from your primary care team to um, sit down, talk with uh, physical therapists or personal trainers, or um, you can you can actually uh, Google around on reputable sites uh, on the internet. Harvard's got some great ones. Um, there's the American Academy of uh, Sports Medicine. Um, and there are, there are certain exercises that are geared towards limited ability or lower ability um, uh, individuals and certain, certain injuries or things, whether it's upper body, lower body, things of that nature. Um, it's just knowing where those resources are so that you can start learning what those exercises look like. Try them out for yourself. Um, but I really do like this idea of leveraging a teamwork approach because um, guess what? Your your doc is going to start noticing when your physical activity has been more consistent and they're going to start noting changes, maybe even in your cholesterol or your blood glucose or um, other health metrics um, as a result of you finding a strategic way to get to yes, basically for physical activity mm -hmm. in some form or fashion that suits you and suits where you are and where your body is. So great question, Ellie. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I find that some people, um, machines at a gym can be helpful because free weights require more, more different muscles. And sometimes for some people, especially when they're prone to injury, it's a little safer to work with a machine that kind of keeps you in more precise posture and work specific muscles and you don't need knees necessarily to do that, you know, and that's more upper body ish. So just adding that. And, and I, I meant, I heard, uh, Ellie mentioned about swimming and just wanted to say that, of course, it does take a pool. There's no doubt about that. But if you can build that into your life in a consistent way, there's just a lot of value to that if it's something you can do. It's just prioritize trying to structure your life. I realize gym memberships and pools are both costs or challenges for a lot of people. But if you can find a way, recognizing that the cost of inaction and inactivity in a sedentary lifestyle will probably cost you a lot more in the long run than the cost of a gym membership or pool access if you can use them, you know? So just to factor that in and, and do the best you can with what you've got, obviously. And Ocean, I think a, a final thought in that regard, I think making your journey as personalized as possible is is so essential because nobody mm -hmm. knows your body like you know your body. Right. And and I know there are some, you know, less cost prohibitive options out there. But once again, it's gonna it's gonna require some hunting and digging. And this is where, you know, I proudly would stand and still stand behind my patients to say, hey, uh, let's do our homework. Let's look and see are there sponsored gym memberships of some caliber capacity? Um, asking the question to to a gym, for example, is a great mm -hmm. option. The worst are going to say is no we can't help you um mm -hmm. but like you might not you, you might not know and i think this is the beauty of just stoke that fire and say hey i'm very interested in investing in my health but i might not have um a significant amount of disposable income to do it do you have programs to to help people in my situation yeah. so yeah. personalize it is essential ask the question of how how you can get to yes and learn different opportunities for where you are yeah Fabulous. Um, Lisa said, while this question isn't directly about exercise, I'm curious about what you recommend to overcome strong internal cravings to eat more when an individual is trying to lose weight and is on the cusp of dropping some. Is there some sort of set point weight that the body tries to maintain? If so, how does one manage these cravings? Oof, yeah, cravings. That is a very, very commonly experienced human situation. And I think to Lisa's question, I think it's really important to really understand uh, forest for the trees in this in this discussion, particularly for what cravings are. And we know that other lifestyle medicine components like how much sleep are you getting? Are you excessively stressed? What does your general exposure environment look like? Those can all be contributing factors to what are causing cravings. Um, and especially once again, um, I think we like to go pretty zero to a hundred 
as quickly as we can. And if it's just, oh, I need to, I need to lose weight. Um, mm -hmm. Is it losing weight really rapidly and not being able to sustain it that's important? Or is it losing weight perhaps more gradually and being able to keep that weight off? And in my contention, uh, the latter, that second example is the long game. And that's where I know that most patients want to be. Um, and so to that end, I really think it's important to understand, um, you know, what a food craving is. And that's essentially a persistent desire for a food. And it might not always necessarily be something that's delicious. It can be caused by something like a nutritional deficiency, boredom, mm -hmm. self-imposed food restrictions that can trigger, um, you know, whether, whether the hormones in your body are saying, I'm, I'm hungry or not. Um, and I think another thing to really pay attention to, Ocean, that is just everywhere in this country, so many um, of the more artificial things can totally disrupt when our brain is signaling and saying, mm -hmm. oh, I need to eat more like artificial, mm -hmm. artificial sweeteners, um, flavors, colors, like be aware of what those can do. Because yeah, there's evidence out there that shows the disruption of those signals, which can trigger cravings. And mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's not what your body is really needing, but it's being interfered with, which yeah. might be causing you to eat more. And it's tanking your, your att attempt at, you know, dropping those couple extra pounds. So I yeah. think that's that's a really really relevant question, and I think people don't know those hidden um, sort of uh, malevolent actors that mm -hmm. are are really contributing to our our progress being hindered. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, and I would say for anybody who's dealing with these challenges, um, my personal sort of mentor on this topic is Dr. Susan Pierce Thompson. We've interviewed her many times, and. You can, sh you can check out the book, uh, Bright Line Eating, that she wrote, which really summarizes a lot of her work. She's focused a lot on the neuroscience of food addiction and cravings, and a, a few highlights just to, to capture here. So yes, our bodies, our brains can get used to a certain weight, and then when we start to lose weight, we, we actually feel like we're starving. So some part of the brain kicks in at a very primal level and says, oh no, we're starving to death, must have food now, right? So that is a pattern, and you want to like, like really love the part of the brain that 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 doesn't want you to starve to death, right? And then recognize that it's probably not actually appropriate to the moment, right? Right. Um, so although it's true as you're as you're saying, Reagan, you know, I think that when people um, uh, go too fast, it can trigger that more intensely, right? Absolutely. So that's where the easing can help the brain deal with the adjustment phase of a slow loss, whereas a rapid loss can be like, ah, and then we gain it right back and even more because the brain is so freaked out, right? So, so helping calm that part down. Um, and some of the things that help are eating whole foods, as, as you were just mentioning, because I, I don't know a lot of people that are in trouble for late night broccoli binges, you know, um, but you really can safely eat pretty much as much vegetables as you want at snack away if you know, if you put having them with a fatty salad dressing, maybe not, or right. you know, even hummus, you can stack up the calories. But quite frankly, you could have carrot sticks and broccoli sticks uh, late night and down them, and you're probably going to be fine. You know, so I do. like, yeah. And I, and I think Ocean, this this brings up a really good point about uh, two points about one, how rapidly your brain. Uh, changes or shifts gears as you start to change habits too. And not only your brain, but your taste buds. Mm -hmm. So uh, it can take up to three weeks to pivot. So if you've been, you know, drinking fully leaded soda, uh, you know, fully leaded being fully sugared, not diet or anything like that. Of course, your brain is going to scream like, give me those 50 grams of sugar. Like that is our physiology. That is our, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Neanderthal lizard brain is what I call it. Mm -hmm. uh, but now what are we doing in performance medicine and the performance space? We are activating that wizard brain that all of us have. Um, and I think it's really prim primo rather, <laughs> primo, primo. Uh, it's really uh, essential to focus on how, how, you can give yourself time to recognize what those cravings are. Is that just a reflex in my brain saying, no, no, it was, it was Monday yesterday and I had a soda and it's Tuesday now and I've had half of a soda and you're, it's pushing back. This is your, your, your physiology once again. And taste buds are very similar. Um, much like if you have ever come off of drinking fully leaded sodas and you have one a month later and whoosh, it just hits you in the face. It is so intense in sugar. Because you've pre-programmed your taste buds, you've pre-programmed your neural pathways. Um, so paying attention to that is a really vital thing for behavior mm -hmm. change, cravings, et cetera, as well. And the second point I wanted to make, Ocean, was this idea, and you you hit it, um, of you know, 
finding effective stop and swap techniques. So if mm-hmm. you're a tortilla chip junkie, which, you know, guilty as charged, I love the habanero salsas and the hummuses and all that. Um, how do I find a, a, maybe a crunchier alternative that mm-hmm. might be higher in fiber, like, oh, cucumber wedges or bell pepper slices or celery mm-hmm. or baby carrots. Um, like you're still getting that crunch, that snap, and you can, you can, you know, go nuts. No food pun intended, but mm-hmm. um, like you, you can, just keep eating and that helps. And your brain is like, oh, this is actually good. And I'm feeling good, not feeling bogged down. So right. little hacks matter too. Absolutely. And and then we find, and, and Susan's work has confirmed this, that um, that sugar and flour are particularly impactful on, you know, triggering food addiction and cravings. And because they can just, flour is tiny particles and they, they get into the bloodstream faster and they, they lead to that dopamine hit, that sugar rush. And so um, people who are struggling with food addiction, you know, I would definitely recommend checking out Brightline Eating and also considering, you know, dropping sugar and flour for a month and see if that doesn't make a change. You may, you may want to drop it permanently. That's yeah. what she recommends for people who are high on the food addiction susceptibility scale, like an alcoholic can't have just right, one right. drink. Um, but uh, you can also try it for a period of time and see if that doesn't help. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, Judy had a totally opposite question. She said, as we age, our appetites naturally decrease. How can we stimulate our appetite so we eat more? Judy, thank you for once again, another fantastic question. And, you know, I think a lot of the discussion about stimulating appetite can can certainly come in line with um, preparing ahead of time. And, and what does that mean? That means either scheduling regular meals or snacks, having snack schedules, things like that. Um, even having smaller portions of just super high nutrient dense foods. And an ocean, if it ends up being an issue of um, not getting enough calories just because you're, you have no appetites, you can certainly, you know, food hack standard meals. So for example, if you're eating uh, pasta with red sauce, you can pulverize walnut, mix it right into the, the red sauce, and you're getting fantastic source of your omegas. You're getting a fantastic uh, fat right there. You're helping with uh, your brain health, all those good things. And once again, it's just strategically interjecting. If it's a caloric deficit that you're trying to avoid, um, things like that, where you can you can outsmart your, your frequency of eating if you really mm-hmm. need to. Um, also, a, a useful way to help stimulate appetites too. Um, Maybe even little things like um, reducing the need for having to use um, utensils, so spoons, knives, forks, um, just keeping it easy, quick, on demand when you when you need it. You have it, it's in mm-hmm. front of you. Um, even something like um, smoothies uh, can help too. Um, but really just tracking and trending what's mm-hmm. going to work for you uh, or, or people who you're trying to, um, you know, help get excited about eating a bit more. Yeah, thank you. One thing I've noticed too, um, I don't know if you've seen this, but um, cold water seems very appetite stimulative for me. So if I go for a swim, I'm usually really hungry afterwards. Um, And um, my parents developed a tradition when I was a kid that they still use to this day. Every time they have a hot shower, they finish it with a cold shower or a cold plunge. Mm -hmm. And I find that when I do that, there's something invigorating and enlivening and it naturally stimulates my desire to eat. Have you, have you noticed that? Do you think, do you know what, if there's a physiological principle to that? I would definitely have to look a little bit further into that, but I know from the standpoint of even, even something like a turning the shower knob all the way to cold at the end of your shower, um, particularly if you're post physical activity, I mean, there, there's so many other benefits to that from a, a muscular regeneration and recovery standpoint. Um, so I would definitely have to dive into the the muscle, or excuse me, the um, the appetite stimulating part of that. But I mean, there there are so many tricks for um, that, inducing that cold so rapidly that I'm learning more about every day too. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. So that would probably be very anti-inflammatory, wouldn't it? Uh, exactly. That helps mm-hmm. the muscles like cool down, at least from what I know about uh, the mm-hmm. cold plunge mm-hmm. concept, essentially. Um, so yeah, that helps with the acute inflammation, but it's still a, a healthy essentially an addressing of the acute inflammation and saying, Hey, you're, you're safe muscles. You just worked out and we're going to build healthy DNA signals to regenerate and grow and get stronger and bigger and get to that end goal. Thank you. Uh, One thing we haven't touched on that I'd love to just touch on briefly before we wrap today is nutrition and diet. Okay. So um, obviously what we eat is the cornerstone of our health and it literally becomes us. What are, in terms of peak performance, and bringing down inflammation, what are some of the foods that we want to avoid 
and some of the foods that we want to lean into. Ocean, I think that's that's one of the most vital and important questions to ask. And I think, you know, as a lifestyle and performance medicine specialist, I think this is the the intersection where even some of the most high level athletes um, don't meet the right marks for optimizing their ability to perform. And I'll, I'll give you a quick statistic. Um, still about 95% of at least Americans are not getting the required daily allocation of fiber intake every single day. Um, and fiber is one of the most, it's one of the biggest bang for your buck uh, mm -hmm. components of the food that we eat. Um, it, it helps get rid of bad cholesterol. It helps uh, regulate uh, insulin. It helps basically pull out the, the inflammation in your body. And I think knowing that certainly those high performance athletes absolutely fall into that 95% number of people who are not meeting that mark. And so, you know, um, when they realize that they're sort of sitting like, oh my goodness, this is, this is an untapped resource of opportunity for me to further max my gains for what I'm doing, whether it's running and qualifying for Olympics or lifting weights. And so, you know, to, to achieve fiber is the, the biggest issue, in my opinion, from a medical standpoint, I truly believe it is the lack of fiber in the American diet. That is what is creating so much chronic disease mm -hmm. um, and, and so much deoptimization, quite frankly. And it's to the, it's at the expense of how much in, inflammation we're retaining. Um, so, you know, inflammation promoting foods are sadly many of the foods that we grow, grew up loving so much. And it's once again, that lizard brain analogy, you know, mm -hmm. as Neanderthals, we want things that are sugary, fatty, fast, ready to go, like a drive through window or that fruit roll up right in the cupboard over there. Like it's, it's breaking away from those lizard habits and going towards those wizard habits. And so wizard habits and smart things that you can do, um, finding, you know, high fiber, options. So what is fiber? Fiber is anything that literally grows from the ground. There's going to be fiber in. So plants, fruits, uh, legumes, whole grains, seeds, nuts, all those good things. And of course, the target goal uh, is between 25 and 30 grams of natural fiber a day. You know, you could pour all the Metamucil you want into a glass, but that's not going to yield a fraction of the benefits of you actually eating real food. And once again, it's just getting out of that very American headset of saying, oh, let's get a pill. Let's put some fiber in a pill. I'm on the go. I got to do this fast. Like you're investing in your health. Your health is an investment, not an expense. So aiming for like, like I said earlier, eat, eat the rainbow. The more different colors of natural foods that you're eating, the more variety of phytonutrients and antioxidants and free radical gobbling up goodies that help get rid of that inflammation are going into your system. And Ocean, I think the biggest thing, and um, you know, we could do an entire other episode on this, is basically building your gut microbiome and why that is so important and where and how you achieve healthy gut microbiome because your gut is your first line of defense for your immune system. And how do you build up healthy bacteria in your gut? Well, you eat healthy foods like prebiotic, probiotic foods, and those come from high fiber sources. So, you know, they found brilliant connections between chronic disease and your gut microbiota. And then you shift your diet toward a, a fiber heavy plant based plant forward diet. Guess what happens? Your gut bi microbiota shifts, your disease goes away because inflammation goes away. It's once again, it's reminding everybody who's listening right now, um, you are a brilliantly built machine. And all you need to do is fine tune those knobs and dials and de-inflame yourself and see what kind of skyrocketing you can do. Wow, well, that's inspiring. Thank you so much. We've been talking here with Dr. Reagan Stigman, a performance uh, optimizing expert and a doctor who helps people to live their fullest, truest, most vibrant lives. Reagan, it's been a real privilege to share this time with you. Thanks for your leadership, for your insight, for your wisdom, and for your partnership in the food revolution. Ocean, it's always a pleasure. And I want to leave everybody with uh, one of my favorite quotes, and it's from Maya Angelou. And it is, do the best with what you know, but then when you know better, do better. And so I hope this is the launch pad of um, everyone who's listening to, to understand that they can um, dial in and reel in their health at any age and that this is day one of that journey. So um, see what you can find. Beautiful. Thank you so much. When it comes to cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes, heart disease, and other chronic illness, what really matters isn't how many books you read, 
how many webinars you attend or how much you know. What really matters at the end of the day is what you eat and how you live. The science has given us what we need to know. Now it's time for action. It's time to implement and optimize your healthy lifestyle. It's time to get results. It's time to say goodbye to confusion and hello to clarity. It's time to say goodbye to bad habits and hello to good ones. It's time to fall in love with foods that love you back. It's time to join a community that will support you in achieving your goals. It's time for a whole life club.